the name of this uh, webinar is Inventing Made Easy. And what I'm gonna do is provide you with a crash course in the inventing process. Because it's my view that inventing shouldn't have to be so hard. I mean, you literally can have scientists that uh, venture off into the innovation world and run into problems uh, getting their product off of the ground. So uh, it's my position and then also the inventors association's position that if there were enough education and resources out there for individuals to get a quick fix on knowledge uh, about the invention process at different stages of development and not just the intro stage so with that said i'm going to move forward uh, and know that i have a wealth of slides available a uh, bonus slides that i've included uh, so that if we're not able to get through all of them, don't feel slighted uh, at all uh, because they are extra. But I think you're going to come away very inspired uh, and, and motivated to keep inventing. Okay, uh, one of the things uh, that uh, I should introduce to you is the Invent Ed Network Connection. That's what I, who I represent, as well as the Inventors Association of St. Louis. Uh, and we both provide inventor, customized inventor uh, workshops and things like that, uh, that will provide you with the information that you need to get started. What do we do? We provide unique classes and workshops that most people uh, tend to overlook as far as the different phases of development. Uh, and what we do is we minimize the amount of research that you have to conduct uh, in order to just gain an understanding of what to do to even begin. So the information will come to you quicker. Our mission is to have help more inventors further their products along the innovation path and become invented. So that's what this particular workshop is designed to do for you, to become invented and not just be inspired by the wonderful Scandalera Center and your participation in it, but what do you do after you leave the scan or graduate from the Scandalera Center program? Our purpose is to gather, disseminate, and create valuable information and opportunities regarding inventor programs and funding sources and human resources that will save you time and money. There are people out there that will help you uh, on your journey to complete, uh, first of all, develop, uh, fully develop your concept and not, not to mention complete your product. Our goal is to set inventors on an accelerated path through the inventor process, offering sufficient information that will enable inventors to immediately hit the ground running. Uh, I'm not speaking to you just as uh, the president of uh, the InventEd Network uh, Connection or the Inventors Association. I'm speaking to you as a once and sometimes still frustrated inventor. Uh, so I get it. Um, so I don't have to be uh, told uh, many of your pain points because I already know what exists, exists and what's existed for years. So hopefully the information that we provide today will help alleviate some of your uh, unnecessary confusion uh, and set you on the right uh, path to develop your customized roadmap. And the reason why I say customized is because realize that everyone's invention uh, process is going to be different and unique. Even if you're in the same field, not every app is the same. Uh, and then also you're gonna have different resources available to you that's gonna set you on different paths or uh, you're gonna have different needs that you have to fulfill along the way. Some people may need money, others don't. Some people may need the know-how. Others are uh, have a degree in the uh, in the field that they're launching their product in. Uh, so just know that it is going to require that you get the morsels uh, and, and valuable nuggets of information to help you further your invention along uh, the path of uh, innovation. Okay, so today, uh, even though there's a wealth of information that you're going to need to get. Today, we're going to briefly and quickly cover the different types of intellectual property IP, uh, uh, review the key parts, components of different patents, because that's going to be important for you uh, as a, a new inventor, uh, provide information about the access uh, available to, um, and access, should I say, available to inventors and funding resources that will help you initiate the invention process. So you don't have to go it along, uh, uh, alone, and you don't have to rely upon what your limitations are. So if your limitations are financial, uh, if it's industry related, meaning you, you're unfamiliar with the industry, uh, hopefully I'll be able to provide you with some information that uh, sets you on track. 
uh, will introduce you to the free services that are provided by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. That's referred to as the USPTO. And as a bonus, <laughs> I'm gonna provide you with opportunity to gain access to $2,000, up to $50,000 grant for startup inventors and entrepreneurs that you can easily apply for today, tomorrow, and benefit from receiving within the next 30 days. Very easy, so stick around. Okay, let's get to it. Let's talk about intellectual property. Uh, patent, trademarks, and copyrights. So what is intellectual property? It refers to the creations of the mind, inventions, literary and artistic works, symbols, names, images, and designs used in commerce. Um, also an original creative work manifested in a tangible form that can be legally pr uh, protected. Now someone said, uh, submitted a question asking if they can patent a, a, a mere idea. No, you cannot. It has to be in a tangible form in order to uh, receive protection. Common forms of IP uh, are patent, trademarks, and copyrights, and we're going to talk about that. And just to give you a glimpse of the different variations of IP, we have patents, which is obvious, uh, with the, the medical field, and then also trademarks. We know the men, McDonald's trademark uh, readily, in addition to copyrights from music, and then trade secrets for recipes. We'll talk about those individually. The United States Patent and Trademark Office issues three different types of patents, utility, design, and plant. Now, what's the difference between the three? Utility patents are basically focusing on how something works. A item or object device that has a function. It's granted for the working processes involved in a new or non-obvious invention. Keyword non-obvious. Uh, patent examiners are going to look at a application for a utility patent to determine if it's non-obvious, especially if it's an improvement. Because what they're wanting to know is if it's something that any regular person would have thought of, you know, to put this handle uh, on this particular gadget. So it has to be purely innovative design, uh, but there's also a, a such thing as an improvement patent as well. Design, how it looks. Basically, it protects the ornamental design, configuration, improved decorative appearance or shape of an invention. The protection granted for design patent is 15 years, while the protection for utility patent is 20 years. A plant patent we won't discuss too much today, uh, but I just wanted to make sure that you're familiar with the third type of patent, and that is the plant patent, and it protects the invention or discovery of asexually reproduced distinct and new variety of plants. That's 20 years protection. We'll also go over today provisional patent application, which allows you to file to receive a patent pending status. So if you've ever wanted to know how can you become patent pending to protect your idea before you're ready to finalize your, your, uh, your innovation, uh, you can submit a provisional patent and be granted one year from the date of filing a provisional patent uh, before filing a utility patent. By the way, utility patent is referred to as a non-provisional patent. So as I'm introducing to you the provisional patent and what it stands for. Also understand that most times, most of the time when you speak with a patent attorney or anyone from the USPTO office, they're not gonna to refer to it as a utility patent. They're gonna say non-provisional. As a new inventor, you are going to be confused between the two. So I, <laughs> it's like, which one are you referring to? And so I want you to become very familiar and fluent in speaking about provisional versus non-provisional patents. So what is a utility patent? It protects a new invention or improvements on existing inventions which are functional. Again, it's the functional aspect of a thing. Uh, they are issued to any functional new inventions or improvements. So if you add a new function to something that already exists, say for instance, uh, VCRs, 
once upon a time, they were just VCRs, but then someone added a, a dual cassette VCR. Then it was a duo a VCR and a DVD combo. So even though, though, even though those particular inventions existed, um, if you make those types of functional improvements, you can file a utility patent. Now, you should be aware uh, of the first to file. There has been a change in the patent law. And don't quote me on this. I think it was 2013, 2014. Uh, but instead, uh, once upon a time, if you were the first to invent something and you just kept it in your basement, never did anything with it, and everyone knew that you invented it, you had proof, um, that was enough to prevent someone from marketing their product, their same identical product, because you were able to prove it. Now, it's first to file. So if someone files an identical product that you've already invented and they filed it first, then they are the one, and they just thought of it last year, even though you've been sitting on yours for 20 years, uh, they are granted the right uh, to the patent. Now, here's the deal. No one can steal your idea and say, okay, you didn't patent it, so I did it first. No, you have to be the in, uh, original inventor. So that's some security in knowing that people just can't steal your idea, patent it, because they know that you hadn't uh, done it. If you are granted a patent, uh, uh, then if your application is approved for a utility patent, and you are officially patented and you come out of patent pending status and you receive your seal and your certificate. So let's talk about the provisional patent. It is, first of all, I should mention that it is incorrect language to say provisional patent. It is in fact a provisional patent application. And if you say provisional patent in the room of attorneys, <laughs> they're going to cringe. Uh, so I want to make sure that you understand it is not a patent and that it is an application because that is your intent to use it as a placeholder before you file your utility patent. Basically, a provisional patent application is a legal document filed with USPTO that establishes a filing date. So if I file today and a, for provisional patent application, I am officially patent pending today. So if I get online and I'm able to do it myself without an attorney, then I am officially patent pending, which means I have a year before I need to file a non-provisional patent application. And if I don't, then I am going to lose rightful claim to my provisional patent. Now, there are some um, different, and I'm not going to get into the legalities of it because I am not attorney and this is not considered uh, legal advice, uh, but just to give you general information about how uh, it works so that you can know what you need to do and not find too much uh, comfort in just having a provisional patent because it's not renewable. There are no extensions granted. Uh, so even though a provisional patent will allow you to perfect your particular uh, application, it just holds a place for you for a year, allows you to speak with other individuals about your idea uh, without any concerns of uh, disclosure. Um, you don't necessarily, even though you should always uh, try to get someone to sign a non-disclosure agreement, uh, basically uh, agreeing to not share any information about your particular innovation. Um, you don't have to do it if you have a provisional patent uh, because it's not considered um, public information because you have some form of protection. However, after that year, if you do not file your utility patent, uh, then you are at risk of losing all rightful claims to your patent. Again, an attorney would be able to sift through the loopholes uh, in order to claim some por a portion of your uh, invention, but I am not going to uh, cover that in detail. So just be encouraged to timely file after you submit a provisional patent. And your takeaway from this is to know that if you file a provisional patent, you can become patent pending on the spot. What is it? What is a design patent? A design patent is a form of legal protection, I'm sorry, protection granted to the, or, or the ornamental design of a functional item. Uh, 
They are considered a type of industrial design, speaks for itself. We have the different cell phone design, cell phone cases, bottles, et cetera. The difference between a utility patent and design is that, keep in mind, utility patent, non-provisional, uh, protects the way that an article is used or works, its function, while a design patent protects the way that an article looks. And let's talk about copyrights and trademarks. There are different forms of trademarks and we'll also cover copyrights first. So what is a copyright? It is an exclusive legal right given to an originator or an assignee to print, publish, perform, film or record literary, artistic or musical material and to authorize oral, uh, others to do the same. It also includes photography, uh, movies and other things as well. This is not an all uh, inclusive list. So just make sure that uh, you look into uh, any, oh, one of the things you should know that's really exciting, make sure that you look into um, different forms of uh, copyright uh, privileges that you can have or uh, that you can submit uh, in order to receive protection for um, your particular creation. But one of the things that you should know that I think is very exciting and, and usually excites most of my students is that once you create an original work, you own the copyright. In other words, as soon as you write something on a napkin, you don't have to do anything else. You are instantly protected. You have a copyright protection and you are able to put the C logo, copyright C logo on your work. Now, here's the deal. Uh, in order to have exclusive rights and be able to benefit from those exclusive rights, if there is any infringement, then you must have had re recorded it with the United States um, Library of Congress. That's the only way that you can fight uh, any type of infringement that you may receive as a result of anyone using your material. That doesn't change the fact if you haven't submitted uh, or registered for, uh, 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 have a registered uh, copyright, then that doesn't mean that you do not have rights to it. It just means that in order before you can fight any type of, or initiate any type of inf infringement case, uh, you have to file with the Library of Congress. This is not with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. This is separate. And so if you're interested in regist registering any of your um, uh, innovations, then you want to visit www.copyright.gov slash registration. Another thing that's interesting about copyrights is that you are granted 70 years. Uh, first of all, you are granted rights throughout the throughout your life, plus 70 years uh, of your death, after your death. So keep that in mind. What are trademarks? Now, trademark is written different ways. So um, as you can see, uh, it is a recognizable sign, design, or expression which identifies products or services from others. Classic trademarks that we readily identify with are sports brands, uh, beverages, automobiles, um, mail service, etc. cetera. Uh, there's also a such thing as a service mark. And this trademark is used when you don't have a product, instead you provide a service. Let's talk more about trademarks. In general, they have more to do with business than creativities. In other words, it's basically what you are, how your particular product or service is in commerce. It must be active. Um, and it is designed, it is defined as a recognizable business name, brand name, logo, slogan, mark, symbol, design, even colors can be trademarked or an expression which identifies a product or service from others. Uh, service marks, as I mentioned, are for services. 
And to give you an example would be uh, like a, a realtor. Uh, that's a service industry uh, or service product, if you will. Uh, and then there's also sound marks. Uh, we uh, had, I'll show you some more examples. Uh, we know the Windows sound when we hear it. T-Mobile on TV, you can get in another room and know when you hear a T-Mobile uh, commercial. Also, you should, before you register for a trademark, either using a patent attorney or doing it yourself, you want to make sure that you look up the trademark, the name, uh, the symbol, the design uh, online with the USPTO trademark database. It's a beautiful thing uh, because it allows you to explore the different variations of use of your particular words. Um, and so you will, if you type in uh, real estate, you'll find out all of these different names and companies that are registered um, as trademarks. So it's important that you, you do that before you overly invest in marketing materials or uh, assigning a name to your innovation before you've actually brought it to market. Uh, it's in, highly encouraged that you look into that first before you commit to a name. Another more Samples of trademarks would include the business and or brand name, a logo, design mark, as uh, mentioned a word mark. Uh, Samsung is simple word, uh, consists of one or more. Google is also a word mark as well. Um, a certification mark, uh, USDA organic, it basically is a form of trade of a trademark that is used to show customers that particular goods and or services uh, have met certain standards. Uh, and then I mentioned the sound mark. Another thing that inventors uh, haven't considered is that you're going to need a, a lot of new inventors are focused, so focused on the patent uh, that they don't realize they're gonna need other forms of uh, IP as well for their particular product, uh, functioning product. And here's a, a good example of how multiple forms of IP protection is used for one particular product. What you're seeing here is a utility patent, design patent, trademark, and copyright for, for watch. And this is something that you want to consider as well. Now, don't overly think about this on the front end of your, as you're in your concept development and or product development, but just become familiar enough to know that this will be in the pipeline. Just in, for the copyright, for the instructions alone, uh, that would be something that you probably normally would not consider. And there's more, this is just a, a snapshot. So now that we've talked about the different forms of IP, it's important to learn how to read a patent. Uh, for many of you, you probably have, or some, have looked at a patent and, it, and been overwhelmed by the content because some of them, especially if you're in the tech field or anything that has to do with uh, that's mechanical. Uh, it tends to have a lot of operational details, um, functioning details, uh, where patents can be 20, 30, 40 pages long, uh, whereas some can be as few as five or six pages as well. Uh, but you need to know how to read it as you're conducting research. And the reason why you would conduct research on patents, as you probably know by now, is that you need to know what's already on the market. Uh, and there are other reasons as well, so let's get into it. In order to read a patent, you must first understand its parts. So I'm gonna give you a snapshot of the different parts of uh, important, most important parts of a, a patent. So, uh, as I mentioned, you will find yourself as an inventor needing to collect, review, and use a number of patents. So, not only will you research, um, dare I say, 50 to 100 different patents because the links will just take you to this patent and that patent, and you want to learn more about not only that patent, 
and the similarities, exactness to your particular product, but you also want to learn your product. Just because you came up with a great idea about something doesn't mean you know anything about it, you know? Um, so you don't automatically become an engineer because you've decided that you, uh, there's, you have an idea about creating a motor bicycle, tricycle or, of some sort. Uh, so there's a lot of things that you can learn from other patents. And the reason why you'd go through 50 to 100, because there are some that are hit and miss. Uh, and so you want to understand how to quickly review patents so that you don't have to comb through 25, 30 pages of uh, detailed information. Um, also, you want to understand your product. That's most important as well. You want to be able to speak fluently about your product. Um, later for the <laughs> terminology such as thingamajig and, you know, as, or, uh, you know, not understanding how the me internal mechanics work, uh, for your particular innovation. Uh, and you don't have to become an expert. Uh, just, just be clear about that. So I want to put you at ease uh, in regards to that because there are certain things you're going to learn that you need to leave uh, to those who are better suited for it. But then uh, there are those of us who are DIYers that will attempt anything uh, and try to do it ourselves. So you want, and in that effort, you want to make sure that you understand as much of the components that you can. This is also going to prove helpful in manufacturing uh, because if you go in uh, without knowing anything, then they can sell you anything, a lot of what you don't need. Whereas if you you have some familiarity with uh, some of the components, then you know what you do need, can't do without, and, and what you can omit to some degree. Um, another thing is that you, which is also most important, is how to prevent yourself from infringing on someone else's patent. So the only way you'll find that out is if you are educated about uh, other patents. And then uh, also how to manipulate the language in your patent to make sure that it's not too broad, not too narrow, to uh, allow for individuals to re-engineer your particular idea. Well, let's have a quick view of different types of patents. Here is a utility patent versus, versus a design patent. The front page <laughs> alone can be daunting. It's like, where do you even begin if you know nothing about these documents? I totally get it. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm an inventor too. So when I first saw that, with degree backgrounds, you know, and it's like this was even overwhelming for me, especially if I was responsible for for conducting so-called patent research on um, things in my industry. How many of these can you go through in a day? And some of these consist of 30, 45 pages. With that said, uh, here's a utility patent and design patent. How, what's the difference between the two? Well, let me show you this. One, the plant, oh, I should say, I shouldn't say utility patent, I should say plant patent. So that's the third type of patent. But nonetheless, the patent number at the top and the date of the patent is what's important. This is going to be the date especially because that will let you know if it's an expired patent. Uh, remember, patents grant 20 years protection. So if this is beyond 20 years, and it is, then that means that you cannot infringe on this patent. Uh, but you can also you also need to know that you cannot use contents of this patent. Uh, well, not shouldn't say contents because you will uh, use the contents of the patent, but you cannot manipulate this product and use all of its components without referencing it uh, and uh, before using it. Meaning you cannot claim all of a sudden claim rights to a patent that's already uh, been issued. Uh, because it's expired. Again, we're getting into the legal legalities of it, and I'm just giving you, uh, I'm just raising an antenna for you so that you'll know that that's something to pay attention to. Um, the design patent, notice that uh, it has a D in front of the number, and this is the, uh, this is design patent number 500,000. The plant patent is 
patent number 5,700. So keep in mind as well that there are more patent utility and plant patents than, than the design patents, so keep that in mind. And that's one way to easily identify, uh, readily identify uh, which is which. Now, you just saw all of that busyness on that particular, those particular patents, but what, is, what were you looking at? Um, there's main, here are the main components. A front page, a description, specifications, abstract, prior art, classification, drawings, patent type with numbers, et cetera. However, what you need to know is that what's most important are the claims. That this is where your protection lies. It doesn't matter as much what's said in here and how well you explain it. If it's not mentioned in your claims, it is not going to be protected. So let's talk about the front page to give you an idea of what's going on on this busy page here. Well, we have the name of the invention. Another thing I should let you know is that when you name an invention, you want to keep it simple and generic. You do not want to name it after your kids <laughs> or you don't want to give it its product name. Uh, you want to give it a generic name based upon its function. Um, and then the next section would be invent oh, inventors or inventor. Uh, so this is that there. Um, when it was filed, uh, you saw that as well. And then the patent number, which I showed you earlier, the date of the patent, and then references cited. Uh, reference and ci references cited is very important too because this is going to help you with your patent research like you don't know where to begin to look up your uh, motored tricycle uh, and you found something similar but where do you find the other ones well in the one patent you found here you can say that okay well they use these um, different patents because this is what that is a reference to u.s patent documents at number four million nine hundred blah blah and it's by the inventor, this is the inventor. So these are where you would find additional patents. So when I say you'd come across 50 to 100 easily, you'd be clicking on these links and going to those particular sites as well. And then uh, what we see here are foreign patents that are uh, relevant in addition to an abstract, which is a uh, brief description of your particular item. Okay, so where do you begin your patent research? Where do you get the information? Google and Bing.com is not gonna cut it. Uh, as a matter of fact, they've made it very easy for you with the, at USPTO office. So uh, you want to make sure that you're very familiar with uh, www.uspto.gov because everything patent and trademark is on that website. The only downfall, and, and I, I don't want to bias you, so don't think negative moving forward. I'm just trying to prepare you, is that it has so much information that it can be overwhelming, but don't let it be. Uh, you just have, because as you keep revisiting the website, uh, you're going to become more and more familiar and you can kind of sift uh, uh, sift through a lot of the things that were overwhelming initially to readily go to different sections that you want. And we'll talk about what's available on it as well. Okay, so with uh, USPTO, you'll be able to look up patents. Uh, and also know this, this is really fun, <laughs> is that like the, you'll be able to type in a search based upon the patent number, uh, inventor's name, product, uh, not product name, but uh, different types of uh, generic forms, bicycle with four wheels type of deal. Uh, but what's interesting is that you can type in patent number 10. What was the 10th patent ever created? And be able to see what was created, but know this, Earlier patents from the 1700s to the 1800s are not going to be, uh, some of them are not going to be um, as detailed or registered or you know, 
to some degree, meaning they're probably going to, content is going to be limited because keep in mind, there wasn't, there wasn't any copy machines or fax machines and things like that. Um, so there may be like a PDF version of it that, you know, maybe they've taken pictures of hard copies of something filed, you know, physically filed copies. So you won't be able to manipulate and scroll through them as well as the others where the uh, newer ones will have links that you can readily click on and go through. So that, that's pretty interesting. Nonetheless, Google Patents is another resource, fantastic resource. Now, some argue that uh, Google is not as comprehensive as the USPTO, uh, but I can't speak on that. I can tell you that it's thorough enough to uh, provide you with enough information for your patent. Keep in mind, the last patents that I showed you, they only listed several uh, references to other patents. So you don't need a pal. You may go through a hundred uh, different patents, but that doesn't mean you're going to list all of them, even if they are similar. You're going to pick your top five, 10, or whatever is relevant, uh, and then you're going to add it to your patent. So Google patents will work. But here's the, the pain point here, is that Google Patents has been there forever, but for some reason, they don't have it readily available on the website. Uh, meaning you go to google.com and you have all these options, you click on the box to the right, and then uh, you want to you know, see all the different Google you know, applications or what have you, and it doesn't have Google Patents. You literally have to type in Google Patents uh, in order to, to find it. So just keep that in mind. Uh, they also have, uh, I have another class that I offered because I don't want to bias you as far as which one is better than the other to use. And we actually go through the search of the same product to uh, or patent number uh, in order to determine what features are enhanced on one versus the other and what's limited and that. But I would encourage you to, to do the same to see which works better for you because one may be uh, more user friendly uh, to you than others. Uh, another thing about patent search, I'm going to move on quickly because I want to make sure I get through the rest of the wonderful content, <laughs> uh, is that uh, prior art searches. You, you want to make sure that even if you don't find it as in a patent, that your research doesn't stop there with just patent searches. You also have to do a retail search uh, in addition to a general search. Uh, journal searches, uh, maybe someone didn't get file a patent, but they still um, sold the item or perhaps they mentioned or referenced it in, in a journal or something. So uh, there are different, and that's considered prior art. So an introduction to prior art. Prior art is anything that's already been created that's related to your particular innovation. So it doesn't matter if it's a physical prior art, meaning that it's actually been patented or whether uh, it's just been a concept that's been spoken about at a trade show. Uh, at, or introduced as a concept at a cocktail party and uh, other people were able to witness that it's already been shared. So any type of prior art that exists is something that can prevent you uh, or anyone from claiming a, a rights to a particular innovation uh, because it became public knowledge. Um, okay, so another uh, resource available, uh, WashU Washu's Entrepreneurship and Intellectual Property, Property Clinic. Now, I'm going to introduce to this to you uh, guys because I think it's important to, to know and be sitting on this information. However, I've recently learned that uh, as current students or faculty members of WashU, that you may not be able to benefit from uh, certain programs sponsored by USPTO uh, that's granted rights to the WashU Legal Clinic to perform because they want them to be performed for the community versus the uh, campus. Uh, and, uh, and I guess there's some form of conflict of interest uh, there. However, I'm telling you about it because I want you to know that they exist and there may be other programs, I'm certain there are, uh, other programs that they sponsor that you can equally benefit from. And I'll talk about that in a minute about, regarding resources. Um, the public library is another source uh, you can look into. So let's talk about inventor resources in more detail. Uh, local and national programs, funding, and human resources, meaning people that will assist you to help you launch your product. Now, this is pre-pandemic list. 
And the reason why I kept it intact is because uh, some of them are still going strong and others, uh, if they have uh, reduced their services, uh, I'm seeing, I'm looking at them now, say for instance, Grace Hill Women's Clinic or Justin Peters, um, if they have discontinued it, they may be bringing it back. So that's the reason why I'm encouraging you to look into um, to look into them uh, before giving up on them because these are individual organizations uh, and businesses that are dedicated to helping inventors like yourself. So again, when I mentioned earlier that you don't have to go it alone, you don't. Uh, what you want to pay attention to are the memberships and networks like Makerspaces. They help you with uh, uh, prototype development. I don't know if they're still open. Um, and I, if, if they were, I, I wouldn't I can't be the one to recommend that you go there <laughs> under the circumstances. So that's something that I'll have you look into. Uh, there are regular entrepreneurial e events such as Venture Cafe. They're still going strong online. Uh, free community services. Uh, and we'll talk about that more. Uh, and then there's available funding that's offered. The SBA is still going strong. Of course, USPTO, they're, trans, um, they're doing things online as well. So just keep that in mind. Uh, let's talk about one resource in particular. Uh, if you are a techpreneur, um, your invention uh, revolves around technology, then know that this is an organization that is still going strong and they've moved to an online format. So I just want to encourage you to uh, reach out to them because their programs offer customized venture roadmaps. They'll help you gain the direction, information, resources, mentoring that you need to take your concept uh, from design to prototype to launch and revenue to avoid waste. And then also financial resources uh, as well. So, and you have direct access to individuals who are uh, either techpreneurs or corporations, et cetera. Uh, also the local inventors association, as mentioned, I am president of the inventors association of St. Louis. One of the things that we, uh, but this is not a plug for us. It's just to let you know that in general, uh, I knew as an inventor, uh, aspiring inventor, I knew nothing about, I've never heard about the Inventors Association. People would be surprised to learn that we've been around for 35 years. I'm like, what, what do you mean? Uh, and so, and if they've been around 35 years, it's just not enough uh, marketing or education out there for inventors. And I can only imagine how many inventors uh, have abandoned their ideas because they thought that there wasn't a resource available. So that's the reason why I'm sharing this information with you. Uh, you can join us um, for free. Uh, one of the things that I did as in becoming uh, the president is removing membership fees. Uh, again, I'm an inventor, so I get it, you know, as far as, and even though our fees were only $25 a year, something like that. Uh, I just know that I'd rather see you spend money on your innovations than worrying about some type of membership fees. Uh, log on to inventstl.com uh, to find out more about us. Our, I'm going to let you know that our website it's currently under construction. So there are a lot of updates that are happening. So I want you to keep your finger on the pulse uh, so that we can give you uh, more information. We're affiliated with just about every major uh, networking organization or innovation ser service program that's out there. So that's the reason why I'm wanting to make sure that you know this uh, information because that's the main way that we get it to you. We don't do spam emails or anything like that. We pre pretty much post it on our site and respond to emails that are sent to us. And Ventures of Illinois Inventors and Innovators, I3, is another uh, wonderful inventors association that's dedicated to inventors in St. Louis and Illinois. Illinois meaning Edwardsville. Uh, so for those of you who are students and you live out of state and you're not familiar, that's not far. I mean, that's a good 20 to, depending on how far you live, uh, 20, 25 minute drive, but you're not going there anymore because they've uh, graduated to a, a um, an online format and they conduct monthly meetings and the valuable information that you get from those meetings with other like mind indiv uh, innovators in addition to patent attorneys that are on the board that participate and answer questions they have individuals who are um, 
also uh, product developers. They're in, in, in online. They're usually in the monthly meetings. Uh, so they participate as well. Um, you can join them. Uh, it's IL, I-L for in Illinois, inventor.tripod.com. And just let them know that Inventors Association or Sherry Renee referred you. Uh, and because sometimes they don't charge the fee, so just uh, assess uh, whether or not. But if you can donate the $25 and you're comfortable with that, do so just to keep every, uh, you know, keep organizations going. But if, if money is an issue, then uh, see what uh, they're willing to do. Venture Cafe, I mentioned, they uh, sponsor uh, frequently weekly event. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> frequent uh, free weekly events, and they're online too. They're a great resource and uh, something to look into. Um, the new inventor series classes uh, online as well uh, through the community colleges. Get this, St. Louis Community College consists of three different locations, Flow Valley, Merrimack, and uh, Forest Park Community College. They're so dedicated since last year, they, they basically uh, offered 30 different classes last year under the So You Want to Be an Inventor series, uh, specifically for inventors. And again, this semester and next, they're already planning for next semester. This semester, they have eight uh, classes as well. They're so dedicated to inventors that now they've even made it a headline for the front of their book. Uh, so if you get online, if you want to take additional quick fix type classes like this one for an hour, uh, that's the place to go. St. Charles Community College is doing the same. Uh, their classes start on, uh, well, St. Louis Community College starts next weekend. Uh, St. Charles Community College starts the following weekend. You can look into that at your leisure. Uh, know that another reason why I'm encouraging you to participate in these things uh, is because your affiliation with other innovators are going to inspire you. Uh, it's going to educate you, and it's going to keep you informed. There are things that are not going to be in this, these slides today that a regular layperson uh, can tell you that can set your invention on an accelerated path just the same. Okay, so I'm going to go into hyperspeed because I want to make sure, and I think I'm doing okay though, uh, I want to get to the last slide uh, about the $2,000 grant for you. So let's talk about Pro Se, Se and Pro Bono Inventor Services. Uh, USPTO, they offer a wealth of information uh, for you. So the um, Venture and Entrepreneur Online Resource Center uh, makes it easy for individuals to do things themselves. People don't know this, and I'm not advocating one way or another, that you can file your own patents, you can file your own trademark and things like that. Now, there are, of course, risks associated with that anytime you're doing anything pro se, uh, but just know that they are there to help you. They provide videos that are user-friendly. I would go on their page and encourage you to just, remember I told you I was gonna provide you with information that's immediately applicable, that you can take action on, that you don't have to wait until the next class or some offering in order to set your, uh, to, to set your, your path for your innovation. This is something you can do immediately. And if you go into USPTOs and type in videos, you'll see all the different uh, information that they provide. Another wonderful thing is they have a 1-800 number where you can speak directly with uh, a help desk and patent reviewers and attorneys. This is like no, none other. This is the real deal. I mean, this is not generic, it's detailed. You literally end up being transferred to an attorney. You'll say, well, I can help you with this, but I need our attorney to help you with that. And you're like, I really get to talk to an attorney? <laughs> and they're like, yeah. You know, and the end, they, don't eat a sandwich while you're waiting on the phone to ring because they answer immediately. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Okay, another thing about the uh, USPTO services is the patent pro bono program. Pro bono means free services. It is a nationwide network that where they uh, stage different um, offices uh, cohort type offices to provide individual uh, in inventors, do-it-yourselfers, uh, with free legal services for patent filing. So that's something else you can sign up for. As a matter of fact, Inventors Association has been tapped into providing the service so we could be the point of contact uh, as early as this October. So that's another reason why you want to stay abreast of what's going on with us. Um, also free annual events. There's an InventorCon going on right now. So if you type in Inventor 
I'm sorry, conventioncon at USPTO.gov. Today, you will be able to participate in the last part of today's event, and then tomorrow they have a full day event as well. That's free. That's usually in person. I have participated in that. And by the way, I'm just not throwing tips out at you. I participated in, um, I visited USPTO office headquarters last year, and uh, I, to even to my surprise, I was speaking with all of the top uh, directors, uh, patent uh, examiners, etc. Uh, and I couldn't believe it. And they were so eager to help. I can't stress that enough. So feel very comfortable in, in where you are, or should I say where you aren't as an inventor, and reaching out to them and speaking with them. Uh, just to give you an idea of what WashU's legal clinic service under the USPTO program offers, it helps you to form business entities, uh, assisting with tax structures. Again, once you are no longer an employee or student, you will be able to come back to the WashU. You'll be part of the community and you can benefit from these programs that they offer. But I'm also providing this list of services because this is what the other programs are going to offer you uh, as well from the other USPTO pro bono programs. Uh, so drafting docs and governing the operations of organizations. So if you need certain forms and things like that as operational documents that you don't have the wherewithal or time or money to do, uh, then that's something that right there in-house uh, Watch You does. Drafting and negotiating commercial agreements, counseling and drafting documents uh, that protect uh, copyright, trademark, um, patents, trade secret rights, they actually draft this for people. Can you believe it? Uh, and I've actually benefited from them in two, for the Inventors Association of St. Louis. They created, uh, they revised our bylaws and did a thorough job. And then also for one of my inventions, they actually conducted the patent research. And what I got in return, to my surprise, was 120 pages of, well, <laughs> I would have never pull the, that together. So just know that they are thorough and they are really good. Uh, and this is where you can apply uh, as well. So let's move on. Um, know that there are other free university services not on WashU's campus uh, that are participating law schools because normally, just like WashU, they usually serve the local community. Uh, and then in general, most universities serve only the local community. And so when you have uh, when you look at this list, you'll see American University patent and trademarks, but they only service this area. Uh, and then Baylor Law School only service Texas, but I circle where they uh, serve those particular universities that service all of the United States, patent and trademarks. So perhaps they provide the same identical services that WashU provides, if, if not more or less. Anything is a help, right? Uh, and then Brooklyn Law School, only patents. California, only trademarks. This, is a, this, is, this list, I think, is about three or four pages. So here's the link down at the bottom uh, that will take you to the page so you can see the full list of different uh, universities. And now the bonus. Guys. I'm excited to share this with you because this is real money. This is no exaggeration, no catch, no pitch, nothing. This is unbelievable what's offered. St. Louis University has an NSF i -Corps program that's uh, managed by the vice president for research. Normally, this is something that's offered to faculty members and students that conduct research and wanting to bring something to market or explore something more and they can receive funding. Recently, NSF, uh, National Science Foundation, by the way, that's this. National Science Foundation decided that they wanted to expand their outreach and reach um, inventors uh, in the community and help them bring their products and businesses to market, not just innovation, but businesses to market and help them uh, conduct a full cu customer discovery to assess the viability of their businesses and ideas. So it's okay to be extremely startup, I mean, absolute concept to development uh, type of opportunity. So they provide financial assistance um, to individuals from all different backgrounds and industry, 
They don't even conduct a financial check and things like that, determine your, that's not even a, a factor in. Uh, they like it if you have resources uh, of your own that you not exploit the program, but that's not stipulated anywhere. Uh, they just want to uh, service the community. Uh, and so if you have a new concept uh, and you, you really don't know where to go with it, or if it's something that even though you think it's a good idea, people will buy it. Here's an opportunity to receive funding for it. It provides $2,000 in initial funding support with an opportunity after you complete that first half of the program to go further to apply for the $50,000 grant. Here's a beautiful thing. You're not competing with anyone. It's not like, oh, we have 10 slots or 50. No, it's whoever applies. And as long as we have seats in the next session, uh, then, hey, we're going to sign you up. Um, but it has to be re uh, related to STEM, science, tech, engineering, and mathematics. And fortunately, most uh, innovations uh, can fall under that, uh, whether you associate, if, even if it's a doll, a regular uh, plastic doll, if you associate it with an app, <laughs> then it becomes a tech product. So you think that through uh, as well, uh, but the payout struct, uh, structure is that instead of just giving you $2,000, you have to you have to be able to show that you uh, spent the money on what it was supposed to be for. So you have to incur the cost first. Now, do you have to spend $2,000 to get $2,000? No, you can spend $100 and get that $100 back and keep recycling that $100 <laughs> if you're on a budget. Or it could be $500, whatever it is that you have to work with. They have a rolling application throughout the year, so that way you can, uh, this is the last slide, by the way, uh, rolling application throughout the year, so that means you can apply at any time, on any day, at any hour, online. Uh, here's another beautiful thing. The next session is as early as September 12th, and what happens is that uh, if you submit your application and let them know that in Invent Ed Network or Sherry Renee referred you. If you were to apply today, what is today? Friday? Uh, they work on the weekends too, by the way, because these are individuals who are just dedicated to the program. But um, I wouldn't be surprised if you got a response by Tuesday, Wednesday, saying that you were accepted in the program. Once you're accepted in the program, they're going to tell you the Saturday, September, as, as long as it, they're not filled. I think they only have, I don't know, it's online now. So it may not be limited to any amount uh, of number of participants. And that's a beautiful thing. But look, get this, it's only from 8 to 12 p.m. on September 12th. You participate in that section, uh, session. You are in the company of other inventors. You learn about the customer discovery process. They send you back out into the universe for a week to try to uh, assess individuals and ask questions to basically conduct the customer discovery. You come back uh, two Saturdays later, participate for enough, uh, again, from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., uh, report your findings. And it doesn't matter what your findings are, success or not, that's it. So with that said, um, here's the link. And if you put that we were referred you, it becomes an abbreviated because they're wanting to reach out to the community, because they're wanting to know where to find inventors, they tap into us uh, to bring inventors to them because this is what happens. Because they don't advertise or market this, uh, they have low participation. And when they have low participation, what happens? They cancel it thinking that people don't need or want the program or service, and that's not the case. So with that said, I'd like to thank you for uh, participating. And I just kind of wanted to give you a snapshot of the, in closing, uh, of how dedicated St. Louis Community College has been and committed to their uh, inventors series. They did this. We offered them one or two classes uh, for their program and they decided that they wanted to make it a, a full series. So people care is the, the moral of the story. And know that uh, the more you participate in the different programs and services, uh, the more programs and services will be created and enhanced to meet your needs. Okay, that's it. <laughs>
That was fantastic, Sherry. Thank you so much. And for everybody that wasn't with us at the top of the hour, we mentioned that Sherry Renee is one of our experts on call in the Scandalera Center. So we want everybody to be able to come in and find a way to be able to engage with us in the Scandalera Center. If you're interested in uh, being able to continue the conversation with Sherry, please reach out to us, sign up for our newsletter, stay tuned for all of our great events that are on our calendar. And we're really excited to be able to work with Sherry. Thank you so much for taking the time with us today, Sherry. We have other great ways for people to be able to connect. We're doing Meet Away Connections every Monday. So be sure and uh, check out the Scandalera Center website for other ways to be able to connect. We have other opportunities and webinars on our, on our homepage. So we look forward to working with all of you. And thank you so much, Sherry, for your time today. Uh, very educational and great way to get people excited about inventing. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Sherry.